Peter Hill Explains, where I invite you to join the science teaching conversation with me about metal recycling. I'm going to do a quick podcast because I've just chatted with a friend and a neighbour who's into metal recycling. It was a bit of a, a inspiring chat uh, chat with him, and hopefully this is probably a I suppose migration of this podcast channel from just me talking with my expertise and hopefully I'll be able to uh, cosy up with people and get them comfortable and talking about their, so they can see what dreadful mistakes I make and uh, feel comfortable uh, just having this as an experimental channel to podcast on. So metal recycling, um, this is something which is very well organised and organised in Australia, so uh, no metal car rusts in a dump anymore. And up in St. Mary's, which is sort of midway between the Blue Mountains and the uh, Sydney Harbour Opera House, or the Sydney Harbour Bridge and the Opera House, is uh, some of their, their, the Sydney metal recycler. And uh, so what happens at the end of life of a car, at the end of life, um, uh, the bits that can be ripped, stripped out of it are stripped out of it. <clears throat> that can be resold and repurposed. And the whole car itself um, goes into a shredder. Uh, like a, like paper, but only a much bigger, bigger shredder. And um, it actually gets broken up into small little components, and uh, it gets sorted So um, by different properties, which is a really interesting aspect, because in, in Year 7 we teach about sorting by properties, and the various things to, to sift and sort. They um, So in terms of the actual teaching syllabus, it's right on. And so they withdraw their little chunks of metal. So this is like uh, treating the car as uh, iron, uh, as an ore body. Well, in an ore body you crush up the, um, the particles and then sort out certain chemicals which are, are separable uh, because uh, a rock is a conglomerate of um, different minerals. So a rock, uh, when you pick it up, is many different minerals put together, little crystalline minerals. A pure, pure a, a, a mineral has got a pure chemical compound and a uh, discernible um, property so you can uh, use that crush up a rock and sort it by properties and you'll get one mineral quality coming out one end and the similar thing is done for cars you consider a car as a mineral and you crush it up and uh, they sort out the various uh, layers of it and one say to obviously you can think of it um, the metal stuff the ferromagnetic ones <coughs> will be attracted out of the mix uh, by a ferromagnet. Now, um, I should imagine there's some physics in there getting the actual um, uh, particles to vibrate such that the uh, ferromaterial can move off and move move up. Uh, and then uh, you've got the left of things which are ostensibly don't respond to a magnetic field. But uh, the conductive stuff, um, uh, depending on the quality of the conductor, you can remove that by having different um, eddy currents moving along. Uh, so this is uh, a, a variable magnetic field. <coughs> uh, creates a eddy current in it and uh, that essentially can uh, push it up. So uh, you can actually... Uh, now we've got to actually think how this works. It'll be very interesting to eventually see and understand it. Uh, so an eddy current uh, produces an opposing field and so you have a variable magnetic field magnetic field and uh, these things will um, oppose and go the opposite way um, and so you can pick up things of different conductivity uh, again uh, there's heaps of separation techniques you know that there's things going to ferro uh, ferromagnetic liquids which I'm not sure whether they use that uh, and then there would be air blowing and actually various moving and finally you'd get uh, the glass and other things and then you could have uh, temperature uh, removing and so there could be all these different properties so essentially it turns to the circular economy uh, a car gets used uh, and the actual um, uh, uh, which is really interesting is uh, this corresponds to another podcast I'm going to go up about the nature of corruption but the amount of, there's a vehicle, an object there, and there's information associated with it. Once we start to lose the information about it, about how new it is, how reliable it is, the actual cost of repair and interacting it with is a car. So there's two cars, identical side by side, but one has a full set of information on it so that you can interpret 
uh, results from another one it doesn't have the information on it you can get the same results but you can get a variable number of uh, answers because you've got lack of information so eventually um, cars physically decay but they also their information physically decays so again important as far as I can see in recycling the actual computers which monitor and identify what's happening with the car is it is uh, is really important for maintenance of the car and of course uh, what happens is an overall system uh, as it wears out uh, the cost of running it starts to gradually increase and now if you actually can harvest the car or fridge or toaster harvest it it then makes sense to actually throw it out and rebuild it from scratch you know break it up into its component parts and that what you are really doing uh, is uh, re-informationing that's my uh, from a, a data scientist uh, looking at you you're attaching new information so uh, a toaster in a box with a guarantee has got some information associated with it uh, but as it gets used we lose the information of it it begins eventually to break and we don't know the actual quality of the parts and now obviously if you build <coughs> a toaster with 80 percent uh, parts uh, 20 percent more expensive because they can last four times as long and then you've got another 20 percent of parts which will uh, break in a certain amount of time uh, even though it uh, will only cost 20 percent more uh, it's, it's actually economically best just to have a low grade toaster uh, there's an example in sweden um, they allegedly according to a new scientist article organized a system where uh, the actual um, material uh, the fridges were or uh, washing machines were repaired by the government and of course as they were repaired there was a cost of repair but the actual efficiency of the fridge and the um, frequency of repair went up appropriately high so the running costs they there's a loss of energy efficiency <coughs> so uh, in terms of uh, circular economies like the um, uh, cargo ships get uh, shredded and re uh, re put up, re scrapped and redone, um, and so it's a sort of like a new harvest harvest stream, and I suppose the associated costs with it. Now, again, a five percent increase in efficiency means a massive reduction in the waste stream, the waste out. So, if you've got something which is say eighty five percent efficient, uh, and you boost it to ninety percent efficiency, you've reduced the amount of waste. From that product by um, a whopping thirty uh, percent, you look from 10, 15 percent to ten percent waste out. So, uh, and, and the economics of that is pretty amazing because you've got the cost of actually disposing of that waste. So, so it's a really interesting aspect to go into. Now, one of the things that uh, my friend uh, described is going up to the Pilbara. So, in Australia, we have massive massive iron ore mines in fact uh, the our economy goes in the way of exports it's uh, iron ore coal uh, services universities and then some agricultural stuff it can't there's services and agriculture maybe down there so iron ore is a massive thing so when china gets under the gun gets pumped up we our economy just goes through the roof and how it's done is there's robots mining these huge iron ore mines it's put on robotic trains and the robotic trains go up to robotic ports and there's a few people you know a very few people and, and the, the weather is incredibly hot and there's these uh, i may be corrected here and the idea of this is the podcast to get this quick podcast out here for people to actually review what's going on and then uh, after the, this quick podcast they'll see but so what i've been told is there's uh, four kilometer very heavily laden trains robotic trains going on this up to 40 a day along these tracks now because this is far higher weight than suburban trains and uh, the tracks just wear out 40 times much greater length so that's four kilometer trains so that's uh, basically a thousand times more trains um, going uh, with weight going through now the, the important thing to understand is that this really does wear out the tracks uh, you will know people doing um, uh, uh, the roads um, uh, will, they will t quickly tell you that if you put a large truck on a road the actual lifetime of the road drops by a factor of 10 as compared to a, sur a suburban little quite suburban street you can possibly get a hundred years out of a, a road before you have to 
So we'll see some divots and stuff like that, but heavy trucks uh, very wear it. And so this is one of the things that um, the uh, the road burden, which is uh, paid by all people, there's a large cost associated with engineering and road costs to uh, uh, to get yourself a road stuff. And the roads actually do get recycled. The bitumen goes up, uh, gets not thrown away, but recycled and repurposed and put back on. Similarly, the tracks wear out regularly. I don't know how much regularly they work, but there's hundreds of kilometres of track, track. So if you look at uh, northern w Western Australia, there's these huge mega mines, sort of bigger than anything you can possibly imagine, and these hundreds of kilometres of track um, going up. And there's also hundreds of kilometres of track going from Alice Springs up to Darwin. There's all these railway I infrastructure. And what they can do along is they just the track wears down, uh, shall we polish it, shall we do anything with it? It uh, gets x-rayed and put, you know, I suppose it would get, get ex metallurgically x-rayed by, by machine and just cut it off, shredded and re recast. Um, uh, there, there you go. And it's, the actual sh uh, economy uh, is a sort of a global network of recycling. So China does various bits, um, Australia if you're at a local area, you, t you tend to do the iron, and then the non-ferrous gets uh, put up to get massive recycling. So that's done 11 minutes on discussion of this, and what I'll do is I'll just um, uh, create this uh, podcast, put it out there, um, and put it out. Um, one, I suppose my in, so my two insights, one is that... Um, Attaching information to a good can actually make it, save it from recycling, keep, keep it going for longer, make the decision more rational, rather than how old is it, where is it, you've got more information to re, um, recycle it. So that's, uh, I suppose, my observation. Uh, and uh, perhaps the other thing I can contribute is that uh, the circular economy uh, requires education of the community to know what to do when they have a fridge. Do they take it to the dumper or do they take it up to a fridge recycling place when they have an old pool pump? Do they um, leave it out for the curb and watch people watch out, grab it and drive away with it? Or do they themselves actually advertise it uh, and uh, describe it? There's a, there's a knowledge uh, has to be associated with the product and knowledge also has to move into the community away and a, a, this is a long-term project of interacting with schools, interacting with people, uh, interacting with websites uh, so that um, the information flows there. So that's a, a fantastic thing. I suppose coming up with the Internet of Things um, will eventually be able to um, do this. So uh, when we take down houses, we uh, recycle the bricks, recycle the wood, recycle the roofs. Um, so it's a, a very strong recycling uh, world which we're having having now and um, a, again uh, um, judgment of quality uh, like they're putting up massive buildings uh, people seeing it and people who do know say Look, that, that building unlike the uh, buildings who put up their 60s and are still here now those buildings will not not last 30 years or 30 or 40 years so it, like even um, hospital which was put up 20 years ago is now this is a big children's hospital thrown up uh, years ago there. Um, so I'm not going to wreck it or something like that, but it's showing its age really, really quickly. Uh, because technology and people change, it's sort of the idea is that we're a view that we're not living in a um, culture. So I suppose this is very different from, say, European culture where you'll, I, I remember living in houses, hundreds, you know, blow my mind, uh, in Fontainebleau in France living in a house on the Rue, whatever it was, Rue Theodore Roosevelt, something like that, in Fontainebleau. Uh, and the house was f staggering. It was from um, the 17-something or others. It just sort of blew, blew my absolute mind. But um, uh, that's not taking hold here in Australia. There are some old houses, but uh, the other modern houses are getting swept away really quickly. Our house, uh, fortunately, is from the 1930s. It's a, a bank house. This area used to be a, a big orchard, and the bank would have certain houses that they would give certain people, I suppose employees, and it's a little fibre house, and it's been built up like a snail with all the different building materials. So as you walk around the 
the house it's actually if you go to the inside it's built one way and then as you walk out and more verandas are added on it's a sort of lovely house up here in the Blue Mountains and it will be recycled and I suppose another thing to think about is uh, the thing is we don't want sort of uh, plastics which releases toxins into the environment and asbestos is sort of things that we enter into our circular economy which uh, serve a certain amount of time but we actually think about taking it out thanks for listening another story comes to a close it's been a pleasure sharing this moment in time with you may you discover truly amazing things understand them and tell others thanks for listening